Well, hello again, everyone. Welcome to the Yeti Sutton Show. Since our last visit, the Cowboys played another road game, another down-to-the-wire heartbreaker in double OT, no less. Yeti, it's time for our luck to change, I think. Well, it was a game that uh, we should have won in regulation. We just made uh, too many errors late uh, in that uh, regular schedule, I mean, the regular game, because uh, I think we had like an eight or nine point lead with mm -hmm. four minutes to go, and we just let the game get away from us. But uh, I uh, talked to Carol Dawson, who is an assistant coach for the Houston Rockets, used to coach at Baylor when I was coaching the Razorbacks. He said it was one of the uh, best games at uh, college games he had seen in a long while. Well, if you weren't emotionally involved, it was a terrific <laughs> basketball game. Anytime two teams go overtime, you know there's going to be a lot of thrills. But disappointing loss because those are the kind of games, if you're going to finish high in your conference, you need to win. I think anybody who's been watching the way things have gone around the Big 12 this year, especially of late, this is the way it's going to be the rest of the way. I mean, you're going to have to execute down the stretch to win a ball game, whether you're on the road or at home. There's very little difference, it would seem to me, between uh, – Oh, uh, two and uh, 12. I mean, uh, we play in this uh, on Saturday. They haven't won a conference game, but they certainly are talented enough to win a lot of games. But uh, Kansas is a little bit better than anyone else, but they got beat in, in Columbia against uh, Missouri uh, this week. But uh, it's like you say, whoever executes the best, whoever minimizes their, their mistakes, uh, they're going to win. And uh, so you got to go out every ball game and uh, put forth a lot of effort, play smart, play good defense, uh, and if you do that, you got a chance to win. Well, as Eddie said, if you weren't emotionally involved, it was a heck of a ball game to watch. Unfortunately, we were very involved. The Cowboys didn't pull it out in Waco, but we still have all the highlights when the Eddie Sutton Show returns in a moment. Well, thank you very much, Kerry, and welcome back to the show. And Eddie, although the final score wasn't what we wanted down in Waco, I think some positives certainly did surface throughout the ball game, in particular the play of Alex Weber, maybe Montanati off the bench, and of course our old standbys, Pete and Desmond. Well, I was happy to see Alex and uh, Brian uh, uh, step up because you, we had lost uh, Weber and Robish uh, in the overtime periods through fouls, and uh, Brian came in there and played pretty well. But uh, Alex seemed to play more relaxed, and uh, hopefully that's a good sign, and that's what you have to look for when you lose a basketball game, you want to go out and try to correct the mistakes, but at the same time you look for positive things that uh, occurred, and uh, I thought the play of those two guys, uh, that was encouraging. Well, this was kind of a funny game the way it developed. It was kind of give and take for a while early on. The last seven or eight minutes of the first half, we really took over and had the momentum going into the dressing room. Well, Baylor is a, a good basketball team. How they lost some of those non-conference games in December uh, is beyond me, I, because They've got an outstanding center in Skinner, and they've got a good supporting cast, an outstanding point guard in Hunter, and uh, they're playing very well. They got beat this week in Boulder, but a lot of people do. I think the altitude gets you sometimes up there, but they're 5-1. and one. They're tied with uh, Oklahoma and Kansas for uh, the lead in the uh, Big 12. Obviously, we'll get a look at this a little later on, but certainly very disconcerting to you and your assistant coaches to, to, to look to your left and to your right and see Brett and Alex over there at the same time out with fouls. Well, that's one thing you've got to uh, do is to uh, minimize the number of opportunities you give the other team going to the free throw line. They went to the line uh, 37 times and hit 28 of them. Uh, Hunter in particular, he was 12 out of 15. Uh, those are freebies. That's why we tell our uh, team that uh, you don't want to put them on the line and if you really do a lot of research in basketball games, you'll find that the team that gets to the line the most times, they'll win a high percentage of those ball games. Well, ironically, we were able to get the lead at halftime and make that nice run in the last seven or eight minutes by getting to the free throw line. And that's something you don't necessarily do on the road, but there you see we've got the four point lead and probably feeling pretty good, aren't you? Well, I uh, told our squad at halftime uh, we're four points better than uh, we were when we started the game. And we should start the second half with a UCLA high post rub, and, and Pete gets a an easy basket, and now we're up six points. Brett, there's a great move by Brett. He faked Skinner out, uh, got him up in the air, drove by him and dunked. Here's another look at it. How many times do you tell your players, pump fake every once in a while and see what happens? Pump fake and uh, also drive that ball to the basket. You'll get fouled if you drive it in there enough times, and uh, sometimes we're too content 
just to shoot perimeter shots rather than uh, put the ball on the floor and try to get to the basket. In the last two games on the road, Missouri and of course at Baylor, Pete's really kicked his game up, has he not? Well, Adrian, I think averaged 30 points in the two games last week, uh, you know, and he's playing probably about as well as one could uh, hope for him to play. Uh, Desmond is playing outstanding in this ball game. Uh, Pete had 29, Desmond 21, uh, Joe 20. Uh, Brett Robich only had eight points and it was slowed up by that, that groin injury. A lot of people don't realize that he hasn't practiced for about a week with us uh, and just to rest that thing and then try to get him ready for the ball game. So uh, he's, a, he's a big key. You know, his scoring and rebounding has gone down here in the last uh, three wall games and we've got to get him back where he's hitting all, uh, all cylinders. It was no question we were most effective throughout the first half and also in the second half when you have Brett and Alex in the lineup at the same time. Well, that's a lineup that uh, we're probably going to use uh, quite a bit uh, against some ball clubs that have size. We're going to play the University of Oklahoma next week, and they're a very big ball club, and uh, we'll probably be forced to play both uh, Weber and Robich at the same time. How about a pump fake and see what happens? You get a guy in the air, and you get a chance to go to the free throw line. Desmond, he gets he a little gets excited. excited doesn't he? He's got some emotion, <laughs> and I, I like that. Uh, you know, basketball was meant to be played with a lot of enthusiasm, emotion, and he certainly uh, uh, does that when he makes a play or one of his teammates makes a good play. It's a good play right there, and there's an intentional foul as Desmond took that elbow going back up court. Right here, it looked like we were pretty much in control because they call a technical foul on this play. I'm not sure it was as bad as uh, the official thought it was at first, but they called a technical foul for a, a kind of a uh, mugging there. It, it looked like that he hit uh, Desmond. And there you see Brett coming over to join you, and that's not a very good sign. No, it's not. But this is a seesaw game. You know, here, here you got 2:44 to go, and we're uh, we're up five points. I think we were up as many as nine or ten uh, with about six or seven minutes to go. And Alex now has joined the uh, ranks of the uh, fouled out. So he's sitting over there with you, and all of a sudden you bring Montanati off the bench and put him in a situation, although this is the technical that resulted from throwing those Nerf balls on the court. Well, what started all that, uh, you know, that's the reason I tell our fans, don't be throwing anything on the floor, it's dangerous. And there's one of the mistakes I was talking about, Doug Gottlieb but lost control of the ball, and they come down, and this is a time basket right here. Hmm. But, uh, Brett got hit in the head with a penny and so the official and there were some other things that were thrown and so the official went over and said we're going to call a technical foul if anything else comes on the floor and uh, not too long after that that's what happened and so they assessed uh, Baylor a technical foul. Here's the last shot of the uh, regulation. They set a back screen scanner on the hunter and he uh, got a good look at the basket. And so many times we concentrate some in the media I think especially about how a team plays when they have to come from behind, when they're behind. But it's just as important to be as efficient when you're playing with the lead going down the stretch. Well, you got to know how to finish a game. And uh, we didn't do a very good job. Uh, uh, we just made some turnovers. You know, if you miss free throws, that's one thing. But uh, just to turn the ball over when you cross the midcourt line every time without getting a shot, that's no good at all. I think somebody else played pretty well in this game was Alexander. Mm -hmm. He had uh, nine points, but uh, he hit uh, three big trades. And there's Hunter. I noticed uh, in the game after the next game after they played in Colorado, he didn't even get to go to the free throw line. I'm gonna, I'm anxious to see how that would happen because he's a he's a very active player and uh, uh, he uh, is a very good basketball player. We're gonna talk about in the uh, notebook a little bit later about something that concerns me a little bit that he does. There's a good play by Al, uh, Alexander. He makes a steal, turns right around, and hits a tray. Well, there, before that, we saw Pete shot at the end of the. Uh, First overtime, if it had just been a split second more, we would have been out of there with a win. He hit the shot, and uh, I think it was a proper call. I don't believe it. Uh, he got it out of his hands before the uh, clock went off. Even at that, though, you've got the guys that you need to step up and carry in a tough time doing the job in overtime. Well, there's a big play right there. They take a shot, and they barely draw iron, and uh, instead of us getting the basketball on the missed shot, uh, we let it hit the floor and, and don't make the play. Here's the not being able to get the ball up after Pete was stripped of it, and here they come again. That's one of the things that has, uh, as part of defense, is defensive board play. In this game, 
We haven't been out rebounded very many times this year, but they out rebounded us 39 to 33. Now this is a shot that some people in this area did not see. The final pass, and somehow Chad got it to O'Brien. It was a heck of a pass. It was, uh, I think, four tenths of a second. When there's uh, no more time than that, you've almost got to catch the ball in one motion, shoot it, and he got the ball down to uh, Montanani, and Montanani got it up. Some people thought it was a three. I didn't think no, it was a tray. I thought he was just inside the arc. Well, I thought initially it might have been, but he was plenty inside the arc. And you made the right call after the game when somebody asked you about the timekeeper. We went back. Wade Pearson and I stopped it. I mean, he had the ball, and the ball was out of his hands. It was still the four up there on the clock. So the timekeeper might have got caught up in the excitement of it all and might have given us a, a little bit of a help right you there. You don't usually get that kind of help on the road. <laughs> okay, now that game's in the books. Another tough one. Cowboys still in the, in the throes of a tough schedule right here. They play at home Saturday against A&M, but back on the road twice. What kind of a mood has it been this week? No midweek game, probably just as well. Well, I was happy, uh, you know, you don't have anything to do with the schedule. That all comes out of the, the league office uh, as far as the conference games. But uh, I think it was good that we didn't have a game this week because the guys could get their batters recharged and uh, – Brett Robies could uh, heal up a little bit. Uh, Stell Laster has a knee problem, and maybe he can get healed up. Uh, and we could correct some of the things that we did wrong in the uh, game with Baylor. So uh, we've got the Aggies on Saturday, and then a real tough road trip next week uh, at the University of Oklahoma and University of Texas. Well, first Gallagher Hall, now Gallagher Iba Arena. This building's been very special to those of us who call it home most of each and every week and we're going to explain on this week's Off the Court feature. Stay with us. We're back after these short messages. You know, since 1938, Gallagher Hall, now Gallagher Ibe Arena, has been really a great showcase for college athletics. No one knows this probably better than Eddie Sutton. You're going to hear from Eddie in a little bit, but I want to make sure we have these facts straight. Over 59-plus years now, there's been some changes. There's some more on the horizon, still some to come. But it has been a great home court advantage, home building advantage for wrestling, for basketball, both men and women. And if you don't think so, let me read you this uh, figure right here to kind of support what we're talking about. At Gallagher Ibe Arena, Oklahoma State has been able to roll up 538 basketball victories alone since 1938. Ever since that first one, a 21-15 win over Kansas. Gallagher Ivan Arena, for me it means so much. One of the only facilities in the world that's actually named after a wrestling and wrestling coach. Gallagher Ivan Arena, no question about it, is a very, very special place to me. 64-61 Missouri, two seconds to go. Cowboys with a basketball. Reeves. No one knows more than I do the importance that Gallagher Iba has played in the history of Oklahoma State University. It is where Cowboy basketball had its beginning with Mr. Iba and what a great building it's been for wrestling and basketball through the years. Henry Iba, Oklahoma State Athletic Director and Basketball Coach, this past fall coached the United States Olympic basketball team for the second straight time. All right, let's go. Now get after him. Get set up now. That's it. All right. Now down comes Oklahoma State for the first half. Dumas, alley you slam dunk to Byron Houston. That was predictable, Tom. Cowboys like to start the game that way. At the top of the key is Godley into the paint, kicks it out. Joe from three. Got it! And that was vintage offense right there. Godley making the penetration, drawing everybody to him, and finding Atkins all alone. Before I ever arrived at Stillwater, Oklahoma, I was very aware of the role that Gallagher Arena played in the tradition of basketball through the years, and that's something that's still very dear to my heart. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the home of the sixth man, Gallagher Iba Arena, the rowdiest arena in the country. Gallagher Iba Arena was built in 1938 at a cost of $1.5 million. National Powers, Oklahoma State, and Kansas opened the facility on December the 9th in a game that matched coaching legends Mr. Henry Iba and Fog Allen. OSU won that game 
21-15. Originally named after OSU's fable wrestling coach Ed Gallagher, the Board of Regents honored legendary Cowboy basketball coach Mr. Henry Iba when the arena was remodeled in 1987 and his name was added to the arena's title. Gallagher served as OSU's wrestling coach from 1916 through 1940. In his 23 years, OSU won 11 national team titles and compiled a 138-5-4 dual record. Gallagher was also an outstanding athlete while attending Oklahoma State. Mr. Iba was a coaching giant in the sport of basketball. He coached more games than any person in NCAA history, 1,105, and his 767 career wins are third only to Adolph Rupp and Dean Smith. He served as coach and athletic director at OSU from 1935 through 1970, and in those 36 seasons posted a 655-316 record while guiding the Cowboys to 13 league championships, eight NCAA appearances, and the 1945 and 1946 NCAA championships. Today's players still compete on the original white maple floor, which was the country's most expensive when it was installed in 1938. 42 national championship banners still hang from the inside rafters. The Cowboys have posted an overall 539-169 record at home with nine undefeated seasons. Over the last eight plus years, OSU has recorded a 125-14 record at home. In addition, OSU has won 78 straight home games against non-conference opponents, the longest such streak in the nation. On Saturday afternoon, OSU can add another page to the Gallagher-Iba Arena history book. A win over Texas A&M will give Eddie Sutton career victory number 600 and his 100th in this storied building. When the phrase home court advantage was coined, someone certainly had Gallagher Iba Arena in mind. That wonderful arena could tell a lot of great stories in wrestling and basketball. There's been a lot of thrills for fans through the years. You know, I've been very fortunate, Tom, to have coasted some institutions that have a great home court advantage at Arkansas and at Kentucky. Uh, but I really believe Gallagher Iowa is the toughest place for a visiting team to come in and beat you out of the three places I mentioned. So, you know, we're going to do some renovation here before long, and we're going to keep the same feeling one has uh, in Gallagher Iowa right now. We're just going to enlarge the uh, seating, and of course, um, more than that, we're going to do a lot more things. It's going to be a very unique uh, facility, and I'm looking forward to that. And uh, I think all of our other, our coaches are doing the same. I think it's going to be a wonderful facility. The 600 wins, you know, I, I hope it comes Saturday. It's been a long, <laughs> you and I had a deal. I think you're going to broadcast your 600th game here before long. On and, Saturday. And so uh, it looked like I was going to get it before you, but that would be great if I can do it and, uh, he, and you will be broadcasting your 600th basketball game at Oklahoma State. Well, again, I was hoping you got there before I did, but since we didn't, let's enjoy it together. The notebook and a look ahead at hopefully number 600. That's all still ahead when the Eddie Sutton Show continues in a moment. Welcome back, and let's get right to the notebook. First item, on the job. It's expected the NCAA Board of Directors in April will rule that student athletes can work part-time jobs. Your feeling? Well, I think all of us as coaches uh, want to help the student athlete as, as much as we can. I think some of us have some concern. Can that be monitored and somebody doesn't abuse it? But uh, I think it's a good situation uh, for the uh, players. How about a quick interpretation of the rule now when you, if in fact you kick your feet out on a three-point shot? Well, it wouldn't make any difference whether it's a three-point or two-point shot. Uh, if you go up for a shot, you're allowed to come down in approximately the same position where you left the floor. But uh, we've seen players in the past that when they go up, then all of a sudden they kick their feet to make contact with the defensive player and when they fall, they're like this, <laughs> and uh, I hate to see that, but uh, we see some of it in our league right now. Okay, quickly, uh, nobody's expecting a 35-point win over Texas A&M come Saturday. It won't be that way. a and has got good players, and believe me, we had the best half of basketball we've had all year uh, down at College Station. Aggie Saturday and then uh, OU on Monday night. We'll be on hand again on Saturday afternoon. The Cowboys back at home, 12:45 tip off against Texas A&M. We appreciate you being with us this week. For Eddie Sutton and our entire crew here at Educational Television Services, Tom Dorado. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>